Our upcoming experiment deals with Lewis structures, molecular geometry, and polarity. And broadly speaking, we're going to practice this chain of reasoning that starts from a molecular formula and goes through a Lewis structure, a geometry, and then finally to the polarity of individual bonds within the molecule and the overall molecular polarity. And all of the pieces are kind of needed to put together the puzzle of molecular polarity. Ultimately, this is going to culminate in a post-lab assignment where you put together a solution guide for the relatively simply worded problem, here's a molecular formula, is this molecule polar or nonpolar? That simple question hides within it a chain of reasoning that we're going to practice in the lab in this experiment and that you'll certainly apply on the lecture side of the course as well. Let's start by talking in general about this process of going from a Lewis structure, really a molecular formula, to the polarity of the molecule as a whole. And the beginning of this is really the molecular formula. This gives you a sense of what atoms and how many of each type of atom are present in the molecule, as well as their connectivity. And the connectivity is often implicit to the molecular formula. You'll have to use some pattern recognition often to figure out what's connected to what from the molecular formula. That said, once you have that in hand, you can begin to build the Lewis structure, and this just involves adding bonds and non-bonding lone pairs to satisfy the octet rules, so on and so forth. With the Lewis structure in hand, we can get a sense of what's called the electron group arrangement. And the idea here is we want to understand how the electron pairs around the central atom in the molecular structure are distributed in space. That arrangement of electron pairs, or electron pair domains we might say, if we're talking about double and triple bonds, is what we call the electron group arrangement. You'll hear this referred to by various names in various textbooks and resources online, but that's what I call it. Now the specific arrangement of atoms around the central atom, the three-dimensional shape formed by those atoms surrounding the central atom, is called the geometry or molecular geometry. And it's different from the electron group arrangement because the non-bonding lone pairs are not really considered in naming the geometry. From the geometry to get to polarity, we have to have a sense of how each bond is polarized. In other words, where is the electron density within each covalent bond? We can represent that using what's called a bond dipole, which shows the distribution of charge within a bond, where the negative charge is, which atom has more negative charge, greater electron density is another way of saying that, and which atom has less electron density and partial positive charge. Once we have those bond dipoles, we can then reason to the molecular dipole, which is an overall dipole moment for the molecule as a whole. The molecular dipole points directly to whether the molecule is polar or not, essentially by definition. Molecular polarity has to do with the magnitude and direction of the molecular dipole. Specifically, when the molecular dipole is exactly equal to zero, we say that the molecule is nonpolar. And we often say that the molecule is nonpolar if the dipole is very close to zero. For example, if all of the atoms are fairly close in electronegativity. When the dipole moment is not equal to zero and is large, the molecule is called polar. It has an overall non-negligible dipole moment, and that has an important impact on the properties of the compound as a whole. This chain of reasoning from molecular formula through molecular dipole really requires all of these component parts. And as you practice this, you'll get better at reasoning, for example, quickly from a Lewis structure through the electron group arrangement and overall geometry. But it does take practice, and that's one of the objectives of this experiment. What I'd like to do now is work through an example of this chain of reasoning using the molecule CH3F, or methyl fluoride. So to start off, we begin with the molecular formula, and this is a given piece of information. It's CH3F for this compound. The co connectivity of this molecule is built into that molecular formula. Carbon is at the center, and the H's and the fluorines are on the outside. Now, how did I know this? Well, via an awareness of the valence, or the number of bonds formed by each type of atom in the compound. Carbon forms four bonds, hydrogen forms only one, and fluorine forms only one. And so, Thinking through it logically, right? Carbon has to be at the center, connected via one bond each to the hydrogens and the fluorines, each of which can only form one bond. So the resulting Lewis structure looks like this, and we have finished with the Lewis structure after we've added those non-bonding lone pairs to the fluorine atom. Now to get to the electron group arrangement from the Lewis structure, we need to consider the number of electron groups, electron pair domains, charge clouds, whatever you want to call them, around that central carbon atom. And here we see there are four electron pair domains. One quick note here, if you're dealing with double or triple bonds, each double bond or triple bond counts as a single 
electron pair domain for the purpose of counting these for determining electron group arrangement. So we could say that the number of electron groups, or what's called the steric number, is equal to four. There are four regions of electronic negative charge around that central carbon atom. From this, we can reason directly to the conclusion that the electron group arrangement is tetrahedral, since the steric number is four, and all molecules, all central atoms with a steric number of four, have an electron group arrangement that is tetrahedral. Now, there are no non-bonding lone pairs at the central atom either, and so it's very easy to go from the electron group arrangement to the geometry in this case. With no non-bonding lone pairs at the central carbon atom, we're dealing with a tetrahedral molecular geometry as well. The hydrogens and the fluorine sit at the four corners of a tetrahedron. And we can actually depict that using a three-dimensional Lewis structure, and that's what I'm going to do now. Drawing the upper fluorine and the hydrogen on the right in the plane of the screen, as well as the central carbon in the plane of the screen, this hydrogen on a wedge, on a darkly colored wedge, coming out towards us with the hydrogen above the plane of the screen and the hydrogen on a dashed line pointed away from us behind the plane of the screen. This is the tetrahedral geometry representing, represented using this wedge dash convention that shows the three-dimensional positions of those two hydrogens above and below the screen. So we've got now the molecular geometry, and now we need to consider the bond dipoles. And the key to bond dipoles is thinking through the relative electronegativities of the atoms involved in each bond. We've got two types of bonds in this molecule, carbon-fluorine and carbon-hydrogen bonds. Fluorine is much more electronegative than carbon, and so there is a significant bond dipole pointing in the direction of the fluorine, and we can represent it this way. Now, the little cross at the bottom indicates that this is the side with partial positive charge in the bond dipole, and the other end of the arrow, the point of the arrow, is the end with partial negative charge. So the bond is polarized in this direction with more electron density on the more electronegative fluorine atom. For hydrogen and carbon, carbon is slightly more electronegative than hydrogen, but not by much. So these bond dipoles are much smaller. We represent that using shorter arrows, pointed still toward the carbon atom, though, because carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So we've now taken care of the bond dipoles. How do we get the molecular dipole once we have all these bond dipoles laid down? Well, the molecular dipole is a vector sum of all the bond dipoles. And so if we were to add up all four of these bond dipoles in a vector sense, accounting for the three-dimensionality, the x, y, and z components of the bond dipole vectors, we would arrive at an overall vector sum that points upward toward the fluorine atom that's a little bit larger than the carbon-fluorine bond dipole, although that's clearly dominating the overall molecular dipole here. And we can see that this is a large net molecular dipole and it's definitely non-zero. From this, we can directly conclude that this is a polar molecule. So notice here, just to recap, that we started with the Lewis structure based on the connectivity sort of built into the molecular formula, reason through the electron group arrangement and geometry, considering both of those is important. Then we looked at electronegativity to assess the bond dipoles, and finally determine the molecular dipole as a vector sum over the bond dipoles, and the conclusion here is that CH3F is a polar molecule. Finally, I want to show off a couple of the tools we'll use to study molecular geometry and polarity in a little more detail in this experiment, and we'll continue to use this example of CH3F as a context. So the first is this molecule shapes FET simulation, and we're actually going to use the model mode of this to build a three-dimensional model of each of the molecules that we'll, we'll study in this experiment. And so for CH3F, we previously concluded that there are four electron pair domains and that the Lewis structure looks like this. I'll just briefly note that the three-dimensional tetrahedral geometry looks like this. And the reason we use wedges and dashes is because it has the shape you see here. If we put three of the atoms in the plane of the screen, one is pointed out towards us and one is pointed back away from us. So we use a wedge and a dash respectively to represent that. So you can use this simulation to immediately calculate the electron geometry and molecule geometry based on the number of electron pair domains or the steric number around the central atom. And we see here they're both tetrahedral as we previously concluded. The second tool you'll use is this mole calc calculator. And the idea of this tool is that it's going to give you a representation of 
the electronic polarization or the dipole moment of the molecule that's a little bit different from the simple molecular dipole formulation, but that gives the exact same information. We'll take a look at that for CH3F now. So CH4 is loaded in by default. We just need to replace one of those hydrogens with a fluorine atom, which I've done here in green, to generate CH3F. And then once you've built a structure here, you can just click Calculate Properties, and it will calculate some of the quantum chemical properties of this molecule for you. So this is doing a detailed quantum chemical calculation that incorporates the quantum mechanical nature of electrons and all that fun stuff. The default page will be the thermodynamics of this molecule, which we don't need to worry about. We are most interested in the polarity and solvation properties calculated by this tool. You may need to click in here to get an interactive three-dimensional model, but once you do, we can rotate the molecule around freely and examine this surface that's presented by default. Now, what exactly is this surface? Well, one thing we should notice right off the bat is that its colors are aligned in the same way the molecular dipole moment is aligned, and the bond dipoles as well, with red in the vicinity of the fluorine and blue in the vicinity of the hydrogens and with the carbon looking a little bit green. This is a representation of the polarization of electron density within the molecule, with the red region indicating a region of high electron density, negative partial charge, and the blue region indicating a location where there is partial positive charge and low electron density. The green is in the middle, so this is close to neutral is one way to think about it. So this surface, which we call the molecular electrostatic potential, or MEP, surface is a representation of where charge is located in the molecule. And it should be consistent with what you determine for the molecular dipole moment's direction and magnitude. So here there's quite a bit of polarization with a deep red color near the fluorine and deep blue near the hydrogens. And that's consistent with the large dipole moment that we determined from our analysis previously. So you'll grab a picture of this as yet another representation of the molecular dipole moment. And the two should be complementary. You'll also be able to see the individual bond dipoles in various molecules if you look closely at regions of red and blue or red and green, so on and so forth, and focus on what's going on along individual bond vectors.